Welcome back to Public Finance in Canada. I'm Keith Kucha. In this video, we're taking a look at part two of our financial management chapter. Uh, in this part here, we're looking at specific budgeting techniques. So this is the second video, as I said, underneath this topic. In the last video, we evaluated our circular process of financial management, as well as the legal requirements of budgets at each level of government. In the next video, to kind of give you that heads up as to where we're going, we're going to be looking at the same kind of idea, the legal requirements. But in this type, in this case, instead of the legal requirements of budgets, in the next video, we'll be taking a look at the legal requirements of reporting at each level of government. In this one here, though, where we are, we're taking a look at our different techniques of budgeting. And by the end of this video, you will be able to differentiate between the five techniques shown and evaluate the pros and cons of each listed technique. I should kind of emphasize at this point that these techniques are not always mutually exclusive. That is, there can be overlap and there can be kind of hybrid versions of each that exist out there. At the same time, in no way is this list of these five techniques an exhaustive list. That is, there are definitely other budgeting techniques out there that are beyond what we address here in this uh, short session. That being said, let's go jump over again, similar to the last video is this is going to be primarily me just talking about information. I will be highlighting big points as we go through. There will be a few little examples that I throw up on the screen to uh, work through and to look at, but by far and large, it is me just addressing and discussing information as we go through. So again, if you just want to throw on a pair of headphones, turn off the screen and listen to this more as a podcast, please feel free. I will give you kind of the heads up anytime there's something big or maybe of importance showing up on the screen that might be helpful to take a look at. For the most part though, everything going on the screen is just an aid to kind of punctuate or put an extension to what I'm already saying. So let's go jump over and let's get started. So in evaluating budgets, it's useful to remember that, well, budgeting is just a tool to create and maintain oversight and control of public finances. That being said, it is also a restricting tool that can prevent the adoption of new services and programs. And I've kind of alluded to this a few times already. Um, if we even just think back to the previous week's videos where we were taking a look at the cost-benefit analysis, say we had a cost-benefit analysis conducted that showed large net social benefits. However, this project was also going to be extremely expensive up front and as a result, it is not approved due to budget consideration. This can be potentially, from an economic view, problematic because these costs of funds are actually incorporated into your cost-benefit analysis. That is, hey, borrowing and the cost of credit was already accounted for in saying, hey, this is a good project. So we see that, yes, budgeting is good to provide oversight and to provide control of public finances, but it may also end up restricting certain programs, restricting certain uh, things from being done. And that can be problematic. Similarly though, budgets also have an additional problem is in that sometimes they may actually promote wasteful or bloated spending. And this at times happens in order to justify or preserve a continued budget level. And I'm sure we've all been in departments or we've all been in industries, either public or private, where this has been the case, where it's been this whole, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of mentality. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend a bunch of our money on a bunch of things just so that we can maintain our higher budget for next year. That, of course, can be wasteful. So let's take a look at each uh, type or each method or technique of budgeting, and we'll explore the pros and cons of each one. Some of these methods are going to be better at uh, kind of overcoming the problems of budgeting we just talked about, and some are going to be better at kind of making the good parts of budgeting really stand out. Um, again, budgeting is kind of this amoral process. It's neither good nor bad. However, it has parts that can be used for good and parts that can be used for bad. So really the question is, are you going to use a budget for good or for awesome? Okay, let's jump over and take a look at our first budget. First kind of budget method is going to be a line item budget. This is probably the one that people are most familiar with. Uh, if you were to go and make a personal budget, this is the type that you likely are ending up creating. Uh, in this case, really what you're doing is you're just listing all of your expenditures by type. 
So, hey, I'm going to have this many dollars of expenditure on salaries, this many dollars of expenditure on rent, this many on supplies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what does that look like? Well, we can jump over and take a look. Uh, that looks like something like this. So, hey, salaries and benefits, office supplies and services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way through, giving us our entire expenditures broken up by the classification as to what that money is being spent on. Problem is, there's no reference to the program or service that these funds are actually allocated to. The focus rather is on the expense items rather than the program itself or the outputs, the benefits of that program. If we had all of a sudden an increase in salaries one year to the next, it would just look like, oh my goodness, we're spending a whole bunch of money more on salaries. It doesn't have any kind of discussion. It doesn't have any kind of information or data here as to why we have an increase in salaries. Maybe it's because a bit of an increase in salaries resulted in a drastic increase in the social service, a drastic increase in that net social benefit such that it was justified or worthwhile. This line item budget just focuses on the costs and thus can be problematic in that sense. Let's take a look at pros, that is the advantages of this style. Let's take a look at the cons, that is the disadvantages of this style of budgeting. Starting off with the good. Uh, the good with this is that it's probably one of the most utilized types of budgets. Like I said, if you were to go and create your own personal budget, this is probably what you would default to. As a result of that, it is easily understood by both the preparer and the reader. So that means that the person preparing this budget can do so relatively quickly and easily. On the flip side of that, the reader of the budget really is able to quickly understand what they're reading and make kind of a synthesis of knowledge from that. From a control perspective, well, really, this allows the administrator to uh, really rapidly recognize any budget variances, so changes in expenditure from one period to the next. This ensures that kind of our spending or expenditure is appropriate, it is in line with expectation, and it is being spent on proper goods and services, proper items. We don't have, you know, a whole bunch of spending happening in this random miscellaneous category. If that were to happen, it's like, well, what is miscellaneous? Um, maybe that needs to be looked at in a bit more detail and classified into things we actually know. So big benefit there is it really is good from a control perspective to kind of figure out where is our spending going on different items. Bad things. What are the disadvantages? What are the cons? Well, really, it has a very limited use in setting priorities or evaluating performance. Uh, in this example here, we have 50% of our budget going to salaries. Uh, is that a lot or is that not a lot? Um, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Is this actually meeting any objectives? Is this meeting any performance outcomes that we want? We don't know. It's not in here. Um, or, hey, are we just spending 50% of our budget on salaries because we appreciate spending money on people? Again, we don't know. This line item budget doesn't give us that information. Additionally, it provides no input into the effectiveness of government services. So again, this 25,000 being spent on salaries, is that an effectual spending? Is that efficient? What about our purchase of office supplies? What about our spending on rent? Is that, actual, is that actually effective? Or are we purchasing way too expensive of buildings? Are we purchasing way too expensive of office supplies? Again, it really doesn't give us that, any kind of knowledge into that. Um, if our salaries were to increase, kind of as we already alluded to, that's all we see. We don't see that, hey, by increasing salaries, we were able to increase workload, or not workload, but work effectiveness even drastically more, and increasing the effectiveness and the social benefit of that service. Again, outside of the realm of this budgeting. This is also the type of budget that many argue would actually just encourage overspending and, hey, spend more rather than efficient spending. And that is because it really does create that if you don't use it, you lose it mentality. Again, as we take a look at this, and again, just to pick on that big budget item up there on the top, salaries, uh, maybe I was just uh, highlighting that there. All we were doing is highlighting salaries that was 50% of our budget it's not really saying where this money is going towards. So, hey, if you wanted to maintain that 50% of your budget was going towards salaries and benefits, 
and oh no, this year we're not going to meet that and you're worried it might get clawed back, well, then you kind of have an incentive to inflate your current expenditure in salaries and benefits. By doing so, you then get to maintain a justification as to I need a 50% salaries and benefits budget. And right, again, you're not promoting efficiency, you're promoting overspending, potentially problematic. Our next type of budget that we'll take a look at is a performance budget. So this performance budget really aims to overcome some of the problems with a line item budget. Uh, really what this is going to do is it's going to include a mechanism to evaluate efficiency of programs delivered. So, hey, we're not just saying this is how much money is being spent on this program. We can actually measure the efficiency of it. In this case, what it's going to do is it's going to add performance expectations to budgeted expenditures. So, hey, we're going to be spending this much money on this thing. And this is our expectation as to what the deliverables of our money spent are going to be. So. Altogether, how do we do this? Well, what you would do is you would group your budget units by program so or activity. So, right, you would have a budget for your Ministry of Highways. And then within that, okay, what are the different activities? What are the different projects happening in your Ministry of Highways? And then you'd have sub-budgets by each department, grouping, etc. You would then go through and you would analyze each program to determine performance standards. And as well as those performance standards, you would also want to determine unit costs. That is, again, if we're talking about uh, highways and say we want to pave highways, what we'd want to figure out is, hey, what is the cost to pave, say, a kilometer of a one-lane highway? Based off of that, we, okay, have a cost per unit. If we want to provide X many kilometers of highway being paved in a given year, we can then work out our expected total expenditure. Cost per unit times number of units provided gives us our total expenditure altogether. Great. What this really does is it allows to bring to focus the objective of the program and the reason for this program's existence. It's not just, hey, here's a department with a whole bunch of expenditures and we don't really say why it exists. It's just, wow, that ministry, that department, that program eats a lot of money. No, 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 it eats money, but this is what it does. This is its reason. It also really highlights the services and programs to be provided and why these services and, and what services and programs need to be provided in order to achieve outcomes. It goes on to look at the volume of work required, how much is going to be needed in order to meet these outcomes, to meet these objectives. And it also allows you to evaluate the levels of service provided in the past. So you can take a look and you go, okay, in the past years, we have done this many units. So again, with our paving example, we have paved this many kilometers of highway in a year. And in that way there, we can then forecast or we can then create goals to set levels of service to be provided in the future. To take a look at an example of this, well, it's going to look something like so. And right again, we have this Department of Public Works for our road maintenance division. So loosely kind of drawing on that example we looked at. Uh, I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger, actually. There we go. Hopefully that's a bit easier to read. Uh, so what we have here is, as we go through it, and again, if you were just strictly listening to this, what we have presented here now is just a uh, little model budget example budget for, uh, again, a performance budget for the Department of Public Works looking at the Roads Maintenance Division. So what we would have is we'd have listed, hey, the function or activity. And that is the function or activity being evaluated is asphalt paving budget. So kind of the example we used prior. The objective, well, why does this exist? What do we want to have happen? We want to resurface the existing paved roads once every 12 years. Paved roads inventory is 18,000 linear meters. So, okay, that's how much we have altogether in inventory. Every 12 years, we want to get the whole city repaved. So, right, this would be one twelfth of it being done every year kind of idea. This is then broken up into all of its expenses. So you have your wage and your benefits. You have your operating expenses, giving you your total expenses altogether. What you would then do is break this up into your performance statistics. So, okay, how many meters are paved? Uh, the average width of road paving, the square meters of road paved per year, and thus you obtain your unit cost per square meter paved. Based off of this, we say, okay, hey, Total expenditure altogether is your 900,000. 
that works out to be a expenditure of $75 per square meter paved. Now we have kind of this unit cost justification saying, okay, yeah, okay, sure. If we're paving 12,000 square meters of road a year, it's going to cost us just under a million, 900,000. If we want to pave more square meters per year, well, assuming a constant unit cost, we would just be able to scale up our annual expenditure. If we were willing to kind of pave less square meters per year, well then, less square meters, assuming a constant unit cost, we could scale down this annual cost. And in this way, we can recognize, hey, if I cut the budget, if I cut the expenditure to this, uh, to this roads maintenance division, I can see the impact it has. This cut budget will then reduce the number of square meters paved per year. So direct kind of cause and effect being realized in that case. Now, that being said, this whole budget method isn't perfect. It, again, has its advantages, but it's, again, going to have its problems or its disadvantages, its cons. So let's start off with the pros, the advantages. First of all, is it allows for meaningful comparison between departments and even within departments from one year to the next. So you can kind of take a look at the efficiency of the department, the expenditure of the department, and, well, really, what was the achievement? What, what did they end up achieving in one year or the next? In this case, you can really assess, as already alluded to, whether or not that work was completed efficiently. If you have a change in budget due to change in workload, or was that change in budget due to a change in efficiency? That is, if all of a sudden in one year we need a million dollars to do this task, well, why? Why do all of a sudden we need a million dollars? Is it due to change in, in input cost? Is it due to change in efficiency? Is it due to change in the amount of work being done? So it allows for that understanding to actually be had. Where this, this can't be had in our line, our line item budget. Disadvantages though, this isn't a perfect method. Um, one of the problems with it is that many public services, they really don't fit into this model. For example, how do you really figure out the unit cost for general management or clerical situations, right? Are you going to work out the unit cost per phone answered for the secretary and say, okay, well, it's going to be about $10 every time the secretary answers the phone. If we expect the secretary to answer this many phone calls per year, this is our expense. Right? That doesn't really make sense. Uh, it's not really a good deliverable in that case. So it doesn't really fit into every aspect of the public service. It fits well into public works and these kind of fields, but not into others. Often a typical solution to this problem is just to include these clerical or management kind of tasks as overhead. So, okay, just as we have here, wages and benefits and operating expenses, we'd also have overhead expenses. Problem with that is that some programs need more back office support than others. So if you do that and just kind of generically clump all that back office support as overhead, well, it makes certain uh, certain divisions look less efficient, right? And that becomes problematic because they now have a higher unit cost because of it because they need that more back office support. So imperfect in the fact that a lot of the public sector is in kind of this intangible kind of service being provided that you really cannot break it down into this unit cost format. Okay, our third method of creating budgets is a program budget. So in theory, this is actually quite a simple idea. It's you just designed to break these budgets down, you break your revenues, you break your expenditures into all of their requisite parts. So for example, we would split government budget into X number of ministry budgets. So you'd have one for the Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you notice I just keep listing the same ones every time I go through an example of ministries. Anyways, you would split them up into these different ministries. From there, you would then split them up into why different program budgets. So, okay, Ministry of Health delivers this program, delivers that program, delivers on and on and on and on. Each of these programs then has their budget. If possible, you can then split these program budgets into their own subgroupings but essentially what you would then do is as you break it apart break it apart break it apart into its smaller and smaller and smaller requisite parts each program would then uh, either come up with their own either line item or performance budget 
depending on needs and policies, right? So some departments, some programs might be better to be shown through a performance budget. Some, well, line item budget might be better in that scenario. So in this way here, what you do is you break it all down into its subsequent components, into its subsequent programs. You figure, okay, what are all the expenditures for this program, that program, on and on and on. You aggregate those together and you get to figure out the ministry budget. In this sense here, you can then take a look at that ministry budget and figure out why that ministry budget is what it is, where that ministry budget comes from and what all the subsequent parts are. Okay, we don't have a little fancy thing to show this because really it's kind of a hybrid between our previous two and just an aggregation from the tiny little program levels all the way up to the ministry level. And then ultimately you can go all the way up to the provincial or the federal level accordingly. Benefits of this. Well, the benefits of this kind of budgeting system is that it allows policymakers to focus on providing a mix of programs, right? So it's saying, okay, yes, we're providing all these different programs underneath the Ministry of Education, um, right? And it, you can evaluate those programs and you can see all of those programs. Additionally, it allows you the ability to break down the costs and benefits and to really review a per program. Uh, all of these costs and benefits on a per program basis, this really allows us for much easier evaluation, right? To say, hey, look, this is all of our money being spent on healthcare. This money is going to this program. This money is going to that program. Wow, this program here is taking a lot of our budget. Well, okay, let's evaluate this program. Is it worth all the money that goes to that program? And then that can be like, kind of, kind of goes, Okay, yep, yeah, that program takes a lot of our money, but it provides a lot of benefit as well. We're going to keep it in place. Or, uh, you know what? That one program takes a lot of our money. I don't actually think it's worthwhile anymore. It either needs to be reworked, it needs to find some efficiencies, or it needs to be scrapped. So it allows for that little bit more fine tooth analysis uh, by the administration. What are the disadvantages? What are the cons of this program budget? Well, Allocating costs to certain programs can actually be difficult. So, right, it seems pretty straightforward, but in reality, often some programs are actually utilizing staff, utilizing resources from several departments. As we already talked about, sometimes, often, these programs need to utilize back office staff. So, often, several different programs can be utilizing the same back office staff. How do you break that apart? How do you break apart those expenditures, all of that into the different programs when there's kind of that cross contamination between programs? So at times there can be difficulties that arise in actually constructing these. Seems simple on the surface, but difficulties do arise. Uh, that's about as far as we wanna get into the idea of program budgets. Um, beyond that, there's not really a bunch more that we can add. Next one is the Planning Program Budget System, PPBS. Now, there's so much to be said about this. There are books written on this. Really, no matter what, I am not going to do this budget system justice. If you are interested in knowing more about this, I'd recommend you just do a Google search and look up. Uh, there's lots of great sources that come up just immediately. Uh, some of the first few hits are actually really great at really giving a lot more of a detailed explanation uh, about this budget system and the ins and outs of it. Again, the ins and outs of this budget system are beyond the scope of this course. You can take courses strictly on this budget system. We're just here to provide an overview of it. And really, if that introduction didn't kind of implicitly highlight the fact, this is a very sophisticated type of program budget. Um, it's extremely comprehensive and it requires a considerable amount of effort from all levels of I'll say all levels of government, but this is even used in the private sector and again, requires considerable effort from all levels within that organization. Um, again, not exhaustive, but it requires the following budget activities. It requires setting objectives at all levels of the organization. So, okay, hey, every single level of the organization, every program, every department sets objectives as to what they want to achieve in the budget period. These objectives are then reviewed and they're then kind of evaluated to see if there's alternative ways to meet them. Like, yeah, okay, this is your objective. This is how you think you're going to meet it. This is how you have met it in the past. But are there alternative, uh, that is cheaper, ways of meeting those objectives? 
then develop, uh, you would then develop budget proposals in terms of each program and activity. So, okay, I would propose to spend this much on the budget for this program to meet this objective, on and on and on. Uh, from there, we develop annual plans for each program. So, hey, this is my annual plan. This is what I expect to uh, achieve. This will be achieved through this program, meeting these objectives. Okay, <sighs> annual plan is established. Then what we need to create is a massive information system. This massive information system needs to be in place to monitor each program, to determine each program's progress towards its goal, to be able to evaluate, are we actually meeting the objective that we set out for ourselves? If you haven't really noticed yet, a lot of this information, a lot of this terminology that I've been using, this is actually very similar to kind of what we laid out in the expectations for the BC provincial government's budget. Uh, a lot of that regulation that was placed on them, such as, okay, we need to have objectives, we need to have our performance uh, plan, we need to have that annual plan as to how we're going to reach it, and our kind of performance progress along the way. All of those are keywords that are in here, and that's really not a surprise. BC really does utilize a budget system with many features of this planning program budget system. So really is a bit of a BC thing here. This uh, planning program budget system, or PPBS, uh, it really aims to improve the planning of public expenditure. That is, we need to recognize that public expenditure is kind of immune to economic pressures. So in the private sector, your different programs, your different departments, they're going to be vulnerable to economic pressures. And those are the economic pressures of price and profitability. Uh, the free market, the private market is kind of Darwinian. Uh, again, to kind of uh, re-paraphrase as to what Darwin said, it's often said, he said, survival of the fittest, that wasn't really true. It was you, the weakest would perish. And same kind of thing in business. Uh, in the private market, the weakest businesses, the weakest departments will perish, and only those that are the most profitable, uh, the most strong, will actually continue. Now, public sector, public departments, they're more or less immune from that. Those market forces of price and profitability do not necessarily translate in. And so what it means is that there's no kind of market forces pushing us towards efficiency, pushing us towards a Pareto optimal outcome. This PPBS, that's the planning program budgeting system, it recognizes that and it goes, okay, despite the fact that we're not sensitive to market forces, we're gonna recognize that as a public entity, we're still utilizing scarce resources. That is money, uh, other equipment, other actual raw resources and material. And we need to recognize that these raw resources have economic value. And by us using them, well, we've chosen to take this away from the private sector and that choice is opportunity cost. So we need to recognize all of these costs and everything in our budgeting process in order to ensure that hopefully we can have an efficient allocation of our public goods or not our public goods story of these public resources advantages okay again that was a brief dirty does not do it justice uh, explanation summary of our planning program budgeting system that being said it gives us the overview that we need for our purposes Advantages of it really is that it ends up linking short-term and long-range planning goals. So, hey, we're not just focused on today, we're not just focused on tomorrow, we're able to link the two together in kind of this happy hybrid kind of way. Further is it integrates program formulation and budget allocation and evaluation in a very systemic manner. So we get to formulate a new program. This formulation of the new program, the objectives of that program, the performance measures of that program all fit into the budget allocation, into the evaluation of that budget decision. And this is all very systemic. It's all very like processed, objective. We know what's gonna happen. We know how we're gonna be um, evaluated as we go through and we can work towards that. In this sense here, it really helps policymakers to effectively allocate resources through incorporating both this near and long-term uh, planning, as well as the repercussions, right? Evaluating both the near and long-term repercussions of their budget, both the cost and the benefits side. So a lot of good things, right? A lot of good things with this. 
That being said, I could probably list just as many cons, just as many disadvantages. Uh, to start off, really, this is shown to be promising in theory, but it's had a hard time in actually showing beneficial results. Uh, as we've seen, it's very resource intensive. It's a very sophisticated, comprehensive model that requires a lot of staff in order to collect, process, and analyze the large amount of data needed. So lots and lots of effort to put this through. In addition to that, many programs, many public sector programs have a real difficulty in establishing clear measurable goals. That is to say, the planning program budgeting system, it emphasizes quantitative financial objective goals. Thus, any program that kind of has qualitative goals, there's no really real way to have a meaningful measurement of success. If there's no real way to have a meaningful qualitative measurement of success, it's very difficult to fit this program into this system. So as a result, we have some difficulties there. Uh, it works really good for things that are quantitative, things that are financial, things that are objective, but things that are value-based, things that are qualitative, a lot, a lot more difficulty in incorporating this. So the big, the big problem I would say with this budgeting system. Zero-based budgeting, ZBB. Okay, this is an extreme kind of deviation from that financial management cycle. So again, I'm just going to draw it. If you just have that earphone, the headphones in, I'm just drawing that circle from the previous video. That is, we had budgeting as our first step. From budgeting, that is our plan as to what we're going to expend. We're then going to move to accounting. Accounting is that collecting, that gathering, that classification, and that recording of our data as to what our, our uh, spending actually looks like. From there, we will report that accounting information. And then that report of the accounting information then founded the basis for the next period's budget. And so we have this circular kind of process of financial management. The zero-based budgeting really rejects this cyclical approach, um, right? In this case here, often what would happen is, okay, hey, we plan to spend, we'll say, 100 million on program X. We go do our accounting and we report, and we report that we actually ended up spending 105 on program X. Okay, so we ended up spending more money than we budgeted, but maybe there's reason for it. Maybe this can be justified such that when we go and we create our budget next year, well, we'll update our budget next year so that, hey, instead of spending 100 on Program X, we're going to update their budget to be 103 for Program X. That is right. We're going to kind of split the difference. We're going to say we recognize your need for more expenditure, but we're going to kind of put a little bit of a pinch on it, kind of try to get you to scale it back a bit. That'd be our kind of traditional budgeting process. Zero-based budgeting rejects that. Zero-based budgeting says, no, 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 no. You planned to budget $100 on Program X. You spent $105 on Program X. Next year, your budget for Program X is zero. In fact, your budget for every program next year is zero. Whatever you spent last year, whatever is reported, does not matter. Every program gets reset to be a budget of zero unless you can justify something else. And the way that you justify a different amount, a different budget than zero, um, is through a decision package. And we'll talk about what this decision package is shortly, not in great detail, but we'll talk about what it is. Um, but first, what I wanna really kind of emphasize is that very rarely do we actually witness a true zero-based budgeting method in reality. Um, typically what ends up happening is we kind of still adopt this whole circle, um, cyclical method of our financial management. What we do is we just, instead of, Hey, budgeting, accounting reported zero back to budgeting is we then cut kind of our reported, 
uh, our planned. So, hey, our updated amount where we said, okay, hey, we budgeted 100, you spent 104. Next year, we'll budget 103. Uh, what we really typically end up see in uh, ZBB, that is a zero-based budgeting method, is that we would update next year's budget to be about between 70 and 95% of the previous amounts. So that is every year their budgeted expenditure is shrinking. Your budgeted amount is shrinking. Any increase beyond the 70 to 95%, so again, we're not shrinking it all the way down to zero. That's pretty extreme. That's pretty radical. Taking a bit of a hybrid approach, only restricting it 70 to 95%. Any increase beyond that needs to be justified, needs to be proven with a decision package. Okay, so what is a decision package? Ultimately, what a decision package is, is a justification of the program and the budgeted costs to provide the program at some budgeted level. So this could be kind of going back, this could be done through our line base, this could be done through our performance base, through our program based, or through, of course, our planning program based budget system. Um, ultimately, what it is, is it's just, hey, this is the amount of money we need in order to deliver this program at this service level. And these are the benefits to our constituents, to our society underneath consideration, if I get to deliver this program. Typically decision packages um, for one program, you'll release several packages, right? You'll release a decision package for the program at a high service level, at a medium service level and at a low service level saying to deliver it at a high level, I would need these amount of funds and these would be the objectives and these would be the benefits. If I were to do it at a medium level, et cetera, et cetera, if I were to do it at a low level, again, costs, objectives, benefits. Um, from this point, the decision makers, the administrators, the policy makers, really, um, they will then be able to take all of these decision packages and they'll be able to rank them in terms of priority, right? They can say, okay, number one priority is this program. Number two priority is that program. On and on and on and on. They can take these packages, they'll rank them from most priority, from highest importance to lowest importance. And then they can take a look at their available revenues. They can take a look at their available revenues and say, okay, this is how much money we have. Starting at the highest priority package, moving down, where is the revenue cutoff point? That is, at what point do we no longer have enough revenue to finance these packages? At this point here, um, we decide, okay, everything that's above will finance. Everything that's below, ah, we didn't have enough revenue. Ah, we didn't have enough revenue. Sorry, these programs do not get financing this year. You didn't make a strong enough case as to why we needed to finance it, essentially. Ultimately, this whole process is very political, as you can imagine. Uh, very political for a few reasons. First of all, with decision packages being offered of multiple different service levels, well, which service level is ultimately chosen for this ranking is going to be important and political in nature. Second, because as soon as we set a cutoff, we know that with this cutoff, we know exactly which programs are going to make it and which ones are not. There's a lot of discretion as to where this revenue cutoff is. Uh, do we debt finance some funds in order to kind of provide more services? Do we increase our taxation? That is, do we increase our revenue in order to fund more services? So, right, there's some wiggle room, some discretion in that. And so there's a lot of debate amongst policymakers as to where that revenue cutoff will actually be. It's not just one of these things where revenue cutoff is dictated. And then because of that dictated revenue cutoff, these programs make it and those ones do not. So. Some discretion to be had there and that's really where the debate in the budget comes in what are the advantages what are the disadvantages of this kind of budgeting process well the big advantage is that it really enforces admin to reevaluate programs annually right the administrators in this case essentially every year every year their budget is scrapped every year it says sorry we don't have money for your program Every year, you need to reevaluate the program to say, yes, it is still a relevant program. Yes, it deserves to be financed. These are the deliverables. These are the benefits. This is why we deserve money. This has led to 
substantially improved efficiency, right? Substantial efficiency gains um, in organizations that have adopted this. Um, it has turned out to be most effective in organizations with massive revenue shortfalls. So, hey, oh no, we have massive cuts in our revenue. We don't have nearly as much money as we thought we were going to have. This has turned out to be an amazing way to really get your different departments, your different programs to really kind of trim that fat to get off the extra, to focus on efficiency and to deliver programs in a most cost effective manner. So some big benefits with that. Some disadvantages, some cons. Um, big problem with it is it really encourages a short-term perspective. It really encourages benefits today, low cost today over benefits tomorrow. So in that case there, it's like, Imagine, right, from this perspective, an infrastructure project. Almost no benefits today. All the benefits are in the future, but massive costs today. This is a hard thing to sell underneath this scenario is, okay, we're going to have all these costs, but no, no real current period benefits. So it really does encourage that short-term perspective, that now mentality. Additionally, a problem with it is it also requires significant informational support. So you need to have, especially during the setup, a lot of information about costs, about benefits of all of these departments, of all of these programs. If this information was not on hand, this is a lot of research, this is a lot of administrative time, a lot of clerical time in getting all this information and getting it all synthesized and adopted. So big upfront cost in adopting this. That is, there's considerable prep time in the first few years in creating this kind of budget. With these kind of budgets as well, they tend to work well, going back to kind of an advantages side, they tend to work well in small organization. Uh, to the disadvantages side, large organizations typically have a lot of difficulty in adopting this kind of budgeting system. Uh, again, that's just the difficulty in adopting it down to the different program level and kind of creating, okay, which ones are going to be adopted, which ones are not. Of the organizations that have kind of adopted this zero-based budgeting model or some kind of version of it, that's been, you know, positive, it's worked out well, but support has tended to wane after the first few years. So yes, they see big gains. Yes, it's working effectively, but it's a lot of work to justify your budget every year. And so what started off as a lot of support kind of disappears as time goes on. So it doesn't really seem to be a sustainable budgeting process. Maybe useful in times of, right, where everything's really lean, but likely not a good long-term budgeting plan. Great, so that does us for our five different methods for budgeting. Hopefully through that, you see that each one has its benefits, its advantages, it has its cons, its disadvantages. Uh, in this way, different departments, different programs use different methods of budgeting for different reasons or at different times. And to a degree, as I said, these methods are not mutually exclusive. That is, you can have hybrid versions of all of these kind of mixed together, taking best features of each as they fit your program, your department needs. So, and right, they kind of fit together in that way and they can be played with in that way. Again, by no means is this list mutually, uh, sorry, not mutually, in no way is this list exhaustive. There are other budgeting methods out there. These are just the five most common that are most familiar, most widely used. If you're interested, in the description, I have included some links for budgets from different levels of government, uh, for the federal, for the provincial, and for a few local levels of government uh, for South Vancouver Island here. Feel free to take a look at those. Uh, as you take a look at them, it's, it is really hard to, as you take a look at it, but see if you can kind of get an idea as to what primary technique is being used in each case. Again, as we said, these are not mutually exclusive. This is going to be hybrids. There's going to be parts taken from each one. A lot of the budgeting process for some of these is behind the scenes, but for some of them, it does become quite obvious looking at it as to which one's being utilized. So I'd recommend take a look, get an idea as to what's happening and see if you can pick out what's happening there. To summarize, in this video, we've evaluated each of the five techniques used in budgeting, as well as some of the major pros and cons of each one. In the next video, we will be kind of moving on, kind of going back to what we looked at in the first video, which was our regulatory differences or our legal differences, the different legal frameworks that exist. In the first video, we looked at the different legal frameworks for budgeting. In the next video, 
we're going to be taking a look at the different legal frameworks for reporting requirements. So again, first video, budgeting. We're going to jump over this whole accounting bit because, well, that's the realm of accountants. And we're going to then look at this legal requirements for reporting. Should you have any questions on anything we've covered in this video, any comments on anything that we've covered in this video, please feel free to comment below. Please feel free to send out a uh, post to our D2L form, or of course, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks, until next time.